All right. Thank you very much for uh, being here. Hopefully, it'll be a pleasant way to round out your day here as we talk about BitLocker and MBAM, Microsoft BitLocker Administration and, and, manage, and Monitoring. Uh, my name is Tim Crabb. I'm a senior program manager on our MDOP team, now working on MBAM. And uh, looking forward to hopefully sharing a couple of insights with you today to get you excited about how you can hopefully implement this technology in your organizations. Um, kind of our objectives today is as you walk out of here, we want you to understand how to deploy the MBAM client and server. And I'm actually going to try to walk through in the demos to give you a very good idea of how that works. We're also going to help you um, figure out how you can manage these environments. There's some actually really cool things that MBAM brings in this space. And hopefully everybody's in here because they are concerned about security and want to find the best ways that they can actually secure their environment. MBAM's a marvelous tool to work in conjunction with BitLocker to make that happen. Next is, again, we want you to take advantage of the extensibility. Uh, one of the things we've done in, in MBAM is we know that we can't build everything as quickly as you want, so we've tried to do things in a way that you can leverage in your environments and make it more open. And of course, walking out, we want you to know it's easy, simple, and can be customized and extended. So with that, let's dive in and, and talk a little bit about um, BitLocker and some of the challenges. Let me just get a fill for in here. How many of you actually have been playing with BitLocker, or familiar with BitLocker? Just so, wow, that's wonderful. I almost felt a breeze with so many hands going up. How many of you have uh, MDOP licenses today? Okay, not everybody, but a good portion of you. That's very good. All right, well, what we did is uh, MDOP is a great tool to allow us to add additional functionality to features in Windows. And BitLocker is a tremendous tool to allow you to roll out. But the comments we heard from customers as we talked about BitLocker and its functionality and how it's supposed to work were things like, I need a simple way to just check if this device that Sam, Sue, whoever, lost this device if it was protected. Now, I'm very cognizant of that at, at trade shows. I get very nervous wherever I set my bag in case my bag disappeared. But how can you be sure if any device in your enterprise was taken or a hard drive was pulled out that it was secure? Okay, BitLocker does that for you, but MBAM enables that to provide that, that great tool. The next one is I need an easy way to determine whether my organization is even compliant. If your CIO walks up to you and says, you know, I, I know you're working on BitLocker, how many machines have we rolled that out on? How many people have actually encrypted their hard drive? Are we protected? If you can't answer that question, then MBAM is the product for you. Next, I'd like a simple way to make the right choices. One of the things about BitLocker is it's got a lot of flexibility and a lot of options, and that's great. But you know, at the end of the day, sometimes you need to just have a good end-to-end -end solution. So what we tried to do is we talked to a number of customers that were using BitLocker and tried to figure out what was the best way to implement it. And so we tried to simplify that and give a more narrow set of end-to-end -end solutions that you can easily roll out. Okay. Next, how do you recover a password to actually allow a user? You know, users don't like security, but they understand it. But they also struggle with it at times if they forget a, a PIN or forget the password to get in. And MBAM makes that really simple by providing a web interface that you can easily provide that key to your users to really get them back up quickly. And then finally, I need a way to make it happen easily. And when you think about an enterprise deployment of any product, it can be a challenge. But when you talk about a security product and encrypting a hard drive, owning the TPM and some of the complexities that can happen with that, yeah, that, that should make everybody kind of sit back and go, oh, not sure how we're going to get there. Well, all of these things were the questions we looked at as a product team when we started to build MBAM to get this solution out to you. And what's great about this is it's only been out a short time. We just released last August, and so it's been just over six months since it's been out that people have been able to take advantage of it. And so if you're looking for, one, a simple provisioning and deployment solution, MBAM's got it. And we'll walk through that in our, our scenario here. Two, we're going to provide you enterprise compliance and reporting so you can actually easily see what's going on across the enterprise and all the tools. And finally, with a security solution, support is probably your biggest concern. We want to give you an easy way to maintain those support costs by providing a central solution for recovery keys and the other tools that you're going to need so you can audit and track and know what's going on at that help desk to manage those users. All right, so let's start by talking about the server deployment. This is kind of the heart of the system when you talk about how we work in MBAM, right? Because BitLocker is available for each of the clients. 
You can put that out there today, and many of you may have put that on already, even on your own machines, just working with it. But thinking about the complexities of rolling out in the enterprise, this is where, ideally, we can provide a solution for you. So let's start by talking about the architecture we're going to have on the back end. First off, you're going to start very simply by probably what many of you did, which was go ahead and put it on your own computer, right? And if you're doing that, you need to just have basically the BitLocker client, and you can enable that. But what we've done is the MBAM client is all about enforcing and enabling that BitLocker client. So we look for security policy to know how to implement and enforce BitLocker, okay? So the next part you're going to have in the architecture is obviously Active Directory. And inside of Active Directory is where we commit and, and perform the group policies to be able to administer in that enterprise scenario. Now, there's a couple other areas we've done. We talked about centralized reporting. So we're going to need databases, right? So we've separated the databases into a recovery and hardware database so you can see what is out there and actually allow you, the keys to be secure. The other one is the compliance and audit database. And this provides a central spot across your enterprise to be able to see the data. Now, to expose that, we've introduced the compliance and audit report servers, which is actually leveraging SQL reporting services. All right? And that allows it to simply go over and talk to the compliance and audit database to provide you a clear solution. Now, the monitoring and management web front end has three parts to it. It has, first of all, a management console. This is essentially the website that provides the heart for the administrators, the help desk, and so forth in the environment. And it ties into both the recovery and over into the reporting services to provide that central spot for you to go in as an administrator and be able to see how things come together. Then we have a web service, the compliance and audit web service, and we also have the recovery and hardware web service. And through these, what happens is the client gets information from Active Directory via the GPO, depending on how you apply it, it'll pick up the different configuration and settings. And in that, part of the settings are where those web services are, how to interact, and how to communicate with them effectively. Now, what's really cool about this architecture is it's componentized. As you can see right here, you can actually put it on a bunch of servers or you can consolidate it to one. And what I recommend is typically if you're evaluating this and looking at it for the first time, a single server is fine. You can put all of the uh, databases, all of the um, web services, the website, all in a single box. It's useful for small deployments, but even with small deployments, you can still support up to 10,000 clients. And what's really cool about that is, is this architecture is not one that is active and has to be connected, and the clients have to connect in order to log in. We allow it to really just check in about every 90 minutes and it'll actually report the information back at that time. If it doesn't get it in that 90-minute window, it'll try again later. And what's great about that is that gives us the scale. And your compliance isn't something you need to have every 30 seconds on your network and a huge infrastructure to support that, but it is something you need to be checked in on a regular basis, and you can control that via policy. So a single server can actually deliver quite a bit of value. Now, if you want a little more scalability and you're a larger enterprise, up to 50,000 clients, you can break out the database onto a separate box and then keep the web services and the website on another. And the ability for that is that allows the processing of all the clients are talking to the web front ends, and then only the uh, web services are actually talking over to the databases and the administration monitoring server as well. So it actually gives really good scale and provides for good ability for you to spread that out across the enterprise. The next one is probably for the, the larger enterprises where you're going to roll four unique computers out. And what you're going to do is put a database on each box. And now what's good about this one from a database perspective is you're really separating out and securing that database. And you're able to actually physically secure it as well. And when we're talking recovery keys and you want to make sure you have a tight, secure enterprise, it's not a bad way to go. Then you confront the web services on that using IIS and actually split those out on two boxes as well. And even load balance those coming in so all your clients in a large enterprise can communicate and get through the enterprise. Now, again, understanding the architecture, you can literally take some of these guidelines or roll your own. If you want to roll out an eight-server deployment because that's the way your enterprise is divided up, you can do that. There's no real hard requirement. The only hard requirement is that we need to make sure that the order of installation matters because you can't tell the web server to talk to a database that isn't installed, right? So you have to install the database, then the administration server, and so forth. And we'll walk through that in the install. Now, if I've covered these and you're thinking, Tim, I'm new to this, I'm still learning a lot about it, uh, the good news is I've got a white paper for you. 
and it'll actually go through in that white paper and lay out some of these topologies that you can pull down and look at it. It actually even gives machine types so you can see the processor and the memory and how we scale tested this thing. So you can be confident as you think about your enterprise, can we mimic and mirror that architecture that, that Microsoft has given us? That's pretty cool. Gives you a good, good leg up on that. All right. When I set up NBAM, what's happening on that backend server is I'm going to create some roles. Now, enterprises aren't one size fit all. You want to make sure you're managing, especially in a security solution, who is doing what and how they're doing it. Okay, so we want to make sure we provide access and that we audit and track that accordingly. So in order to do that, we provide a set of roles that are created. So on the install of MBAM, we create on that box that you install it local groups that match the following. System administrators, hardware users, report users, help desk users, and advanced help desk users. And I'll tell you, if you want to impress somebody, tell them they're an advanced help desk user. They'll love it. Uh, it's kind of fun. And we'll tell you, show you the differences. And we provide rights and roles on that. Now, what's neat about these is because they're local groups, if you're doing one box or you're doing you know, multiple boxes, take a domain group, make it a member of that local group, and that's how you manage it. So you're managing from the domain. But we did want to make those as local groups so you can get in. Now, the one gotcha that we want to call out here is in multi-server deployments, you need to make sure that the MBAM report users is common between all of them, or you're going to have really a bad experience. Meaning, if I take my security group called Help Desk, and I make them a member of the report users, and then on the secondary box, I don't make the Help Desk security group part of it, but only two members of the Help Desk, then I'm going to have some real inconsistencies. So be consistent as you put them in. I recommend security groups instead of just users, but you can actually do that. The uh, administrator, whoever installs MBAM, is automatically placed in the system administrators group. And that's your super user. They can do anything. But the other roles, as they go through, will limit the amount of capability that they have inside of the portal. And the advantage of that is, again, when we talk about security rights and responsibilities, we don't want to expose too much to too many users. So let's take a look at the help desk users. And I'll show you this in the demo. If I'm a help desk user, a tier one, we'll say, that takes general calls, if I'm handing out a security key, I want to make sure that they give enough information that that user just can't go out and start pulling out keys and going and getting in people's secure data. So they actually have to require a user ID and then a recovery key. And I'll show you, show you the difference in this and what they see. And their view in the portal, we actually remove a number of tabs that they can only do that one specific task. Now, if they're an advanced help desk user, your tier two person, they don't have to have as many things to actually do this. They'll actually only have to have the recovery key. So this is when you're working with somebody, you're escalating through the help desk channels, uh, we try to make it easier, faster, and increase the level of trust based on what people can see. Okay? All right. Uh, we talked about the local groups, so we'll move on. Okay, secure database communications. We've talked a lot about being a secure solution, and that's very important as we talk about security that you make sure that communication is secure from the client all the way back to that backend database. And, and the important thing about that is that way you can be sure that that key that in, we uh, actually use to recover that secure data on that uh, disk is, as it's being passed from the client, back to the web services, back to the database, and stored in the database, it's secure along that whole path. Now the key on this is that you make sure you're using the certificates correctly and actually doing the following. You need to actually configure the SQL database to force encryption. We actually require, um, I, I believe I call it down down below, we require a SQL enterprise so we can actually use a feature called transparent data encryption. And what that allows you to do is actually encrypt all the data on the fly so data when it's at rest on the disk is actually encrypted. So those keys can't be uh, tampered with ideally even when the database is at rest and they'll be pulled out. But you need to actually make sure, and you follow these steps as you look, that you want to configure the database to be secure. You want to configure the ser web services to talk via SSL. And then you need to provision a certificate before you install MBAM in order to select it. And the MBAM install will actually show you any certificates available on that box you're installing. And it'll actually leverage that, allow you to select it, and move forward with the install. Now, during the deployment, you can follow the steps down there. Again, you're going to select that certificate at that time that's in the install. Again, it has to be provisioned before. And then you'll select that and you'll be able to move forward. And again, the database encrypts on the back end. It's important that you think about this as you look at the solution because one of the concerns we, we hear from support 
is customers just assume it's 100% secure out of the box. And that's not a technology challenge. That's making sure that the certificates are there so we can take advantage of them. And that's something you have to manage in your enterprise. Okay? So just be aware of that, that there are some steps that you have to do. That's why we want to call this out. Now, if you're doing an, a pilot and evaluation of this, wholeheartedly encourage you to just, you can just throw it up there. You don't need to worry as much about the certificates. That's what I'm going to do today in my demo. I'm not going to take a lot of the certificate stuff because it complicates my demo, and uh, we like simple demos. But uh, you'll see that as we go through, and you can do the same thing. All right, scalability and failover. We talked a little bit about this, and this is really based on how you deploy. Do I have a one box? Do I go with a multi-box scenario? But typically, we can see easily up to 25,000 clients, easily scaling above 100,000. Again, a lot of this is the, the ability of how it works. Failover options. This is kind of an interesting scenario because I, I get asked by a lot of people, how do we do the failover on this to make sure it works? And you've got to think about how this works as well. If you look at the bottom here, we talk about the client and web services behaviors. So the client itself, if it's unable to contact that web service, so let's assume we've done a single box install and something's happened to that server and it's down for a couple of hours, okay? What is going to be the, the impact to the enterprise? All right, the client is going to try to contact the web service. And if it's unable to do that, if it's a new client and is trying to encrypt, it will not be able to encrypt. So if you think about how you roll this out in your enterprise, depending on how you're staging it and things like that, it's, you're going to be able to control that. And if they can't encrypt then, they'll be able to take the task, postpone, and I'll show you this in the client deployment. It'll postpone 90 minutes and try again. So it's fairly redundant in that regard. If they're actually reporting status, the web service, the client doesn't queue that up and pass it to the web service later. It just tries again in that retry timetable of 90 minutes. Okay? So it's still important to have some sort of failover, redundancy, depending on how you want to do it. But I guess the point of calling this out is compliance isn't something that needs to be decided every minute of every hour for every machine in your enterprise. And that's how we're able to scale. We say every 90 minutes. By default, if you want to make that longer, you can even do that. Okay? And so when you're looking at SQL failover solutions, we support the database mirroring. Currently, we don't support installing into a SQL cluster. We're working on, on uh, feedback. We've gotten a lot of feedback from customers right now. But today, you'll need to put up a SQL mirroring. That'll give you the capability to, to have that. And then certainly, you can use load balancing in front uh, to have multiple administration and monitoring servers in front, and then have that balance the clients as they come in. So if one of those goes down, you can still run. Okay? All right, let's move forward. This is the uh, required hardware list of requirements, the most boring slide in the deck, but I included it here so you can all see as a reference to have it. Um, this calls out, like I said, the requirements on SQL. You cannot use SQL Express because it doesn't have the features and functionality we need. So that's why we list that. Uh, basically, web. Uh, Windows Server 2008 uh, or higher, you'll be able to use that and go ahead and leverage it. Now, on the client, we're tied to Windows 7 Enterprise and, and Ultimate, okay? And we do do a hard check on that. When the client goes to install, if it doesn't meet that, if it is trying to install on Windows Professional or Home, it will not install. Uh, there's no BitLocker engine for us to leverage there, okay? All right. Let's move into a demo. Been talking a long time. Let's actually look at something fun. Okay. It's always exciting to push the first button up here. You just hope it works. All right, so here I am. I'm actually on a uh, Windows server here. I've set this up. I've got a um, domain controller. I'm on the server. We've connected, created the network, and I'm just going to go ahead and launch the MBAM setup. Okay? I haven't lost anybody yet, have I? Okay. This is uh, pretty simple so far. Now, the server install, it's, pretty sim it's a, a pretty simple to launch, but it's fairly complex in the back end. We're actually trying to do a lot of things to ideally make your life much more simple and easier to do. So when it comes up, pretty nice looking install. I'm going to actually not go out and uh, check for the latest updates. I recommend that. But because I'm in a demo environment, I'm not going to. I'm not connected to the internet to do this. Um, we go ahead and we'll read. And accept and move forward. Now, 
What you see here is a list of all the services. Now remember that architecture slide I showed you, that represents each of these boxes. So now if I was going to do a multi-box install, what would I install first? I need to lay down the databases, right? Because we said we have to have that there in order for anything else to do it. So if you came down here and deselected these and then went and tried to install the administration monitoring server first, you're going to have problems because it's going to ask you, where is your database server? What's the URL? It's going to ask you to test it, and you're going to fail and have problems. So we really try to help you out here by just saying, okay, here's the list of stuff you're going to install. Just do it in this order, and you're okay. If you're doing a single box install, just run down and hit next. Super easy, simple to do. So I'll just leave it here. I've got, again, the recovery hardware database, the compliance audit database, the reporting server, the monitoring server, and, of course, the policy templates. These all have to be installed. Now, again, the single box is the easiest way to do it. Um, if you're piloting this and, and trying it in a lab environment, highly recommend this very simple, easy way to do it. All right, I'll go ahead and hit next. Now, remember that system requirement slide we had? This is going through and checking all the prerequisites. And this is actually one of my favorite parts of an install, if you can have a favorite part of the install. How many of you have done something, gone in an install, and it just fails, and you don't know why, and you're going through logs, trying to figure it out? It's enough to make you pull your hair out. Um, as you can see, I have a beautiful head of hair, so I haven't done that with this install. Uh, the idea with this is you're able to go in and have it go through and do a fairly exhaustive check of the system requirements. So we're checking to see a SQL installed. Is it the right version? Is it the right version of Windows? And we're running these checks to make sure that anything that you've checked on there is set up. If you're installing the administration and uh, monitoring server, we're checking to see is IIS configured? Does it have the right web services set up? Are all those things available to us? And if they are, then we can go ahead and install, right? And I think that's a lot better than failing and having challenges. And if you do fail, it'll actually pull it up, give you an error, and then you can try to go fix it. It'll tell you what that, what failed, what that system requirement was that failed, and then you can say, run the prerequisite check again and then just go and start running through. All right, so we're not gonna do a certificate. That's why it's saying it can't, it can't find that. I'm not gonna worry about that because I'm not installing a, uh, encrypted communication. We're just doing a, a demo pilot here, so very simple to do. Okay, it comes in, and again, I'm doing a single box, so it detects immediately that it's got SQL installed on here. There's only one uh, database server and no instances, so I don't have to put an instance path in here. And I, it'll go ahead and ask me to go ahead and confirm this information. If you wanted to change it, technically you could, but I wouldn't change it. <laughs> it's pretty easy to leave. Again, now I'm putting down the compliance database. We'll lay that on. And then it's going to ask me actually for a database uh, name or for a user account. And this user account is what it's actually going to use to go out and uh, pull the information when it goes and hits the database. So this account needs to have rights to the database. This is the one we're actually using to access the database itself. Okay. And this should be all right. There we go. Okay, the port. Again, this is allowing us to how we're going to actually access the administration monitoring server. By default, we take the root of the server that this is installed on. Okay, so if you're installing the administration monitoring server, it's going to take the root. You can use a host name if you choose. Um, by default, we'll just take the machine name. If you're going to use a host name, it should be set up before you do the install. Uh, just be aware of that. We'll go ahead and hit next. Again, I'm on a system uh, not connected to the internet, so I'm going to say do not, but I encourage everybody to always select Microsoft Update. Helps us out a lot on the engineering team if we're trying to get you the right uh, results and patches over time. Okay, so we've got our features selected. This is our little summary screen going through just telling us what we need to do and, and all those good things. Now let's go ahead and hit install. Okay, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Allows us to just go ahead and get that going. I'm not going to sit here and watch it all go through. It takes a, a couple of minutes while it goes through and does the checks and get all that going. But that's pretty simple. Pretty simple for an enterprise product. Allows you to get that rolled out, get it going very quickly, and get your system set up. So hopefully everybody in here seeing this is going, wow, maybe I'll go home and try that. I hope so. I hope so. I think it's a really great way to get you started on this. Okay. So we've got the server infrastructure uh, deploying, not quite deployed yet, but it's actually going. Now let's talk about the client. So once I get that server infrastructure out there, I need to get the client going. 
and push that out in my enterprise. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. The client, as I said, is all about enforcing and enabling uh, BitLocker. Okay, so we're going to get that via policy. It's a policy-driven client. That's how it works. That how it gets. That's how it gets its uh, information. So we've given that ability to leverage the directory to do that. The next part of it is is how do I get on the desktops? And there's two methods. One before the user receives a machine, give it to them, or after. Okay. So the best way to do this before they receive it is part of your standard deployment practices. And so using MDT or SCCM's uh, OSD, you can actually preload this on a user's machine even before they log in. Now what's great about that is who, who here has done BitLocker? Is it, is it super fast to encrypt? <laughs> no. <laughs> it, today in Windows 7 it requires encryption on the entire drive. So if I have a, a 250 gig uh, OS volume that I'm using, that's going to take some time, right? Uh, how many of you have really patient users that love to wait for things? Oh, I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, interesting. Uh, so the idea is encryption can be a background process, and you can get away with that. It's, it's actually not as bad, but it does take cycles on the processor. And what's cool about encryption is even if you turn the machine off, you can uh, stop it midway through, turn it back on, and it'll continue and finish encryption. So I guess it's not that high of a pain threshold, but users get very nervous when they see that hard drive light flashing, and they're claiming it's not going to be as fast. So if you can use MDT, it's actually pretty cool, because what you can do with this is you can manage the TPM process. In MBAM, we have to be able to access the TPM. So typically, we'll try to own it, or at least have to have access to the TPM. So that has to be on in your device. This works out really well if you're enabling a new piece of hardware, because then you can actually go and adjust it if it does need to be adjusted. Okay, so then you're going to configure the TPM, and you're going to not, you're going to configure the TPM as a way to actually uh, store the encryption, right? So what we do is we generate an encryption key, we store it in the TPM, we go ahead and encrypt the drive. And there's several ways you can do this, from joining the domain to using a domain joined user to not doing either of those and just actually encrypting the drive and moving forward. That's probably the one I would do. But what happens, the experience for the user is, is the user then gets this brand new piece of hardware, they turn it on, they log in with the domain, uh, Tim at Contoso, and it's going to go out and read my policy based on my user, based on my machine. It's going to pull down that policy. Now, once it gets that policy, what's the MBAM agent going to do? It's going to enforce and enable. So it's going to look at that drive and say, you know what, it's only encrypted with a TPM. I also need a PIN. It'll immediately prompt the user. The user goes ahead and creates their PIN, and they're off and running. They never have to encrypt the drive because it's all pre-encrypted. Pretty cool. I encourage you to take a look at that white paper. It gives you the three different methods. You can use this in a pre-deployment scenario, and it, it will really save you a lot of uh, questions from your users. Now, if you have machines out there already, you can go ahead and encrypt after. And we actually do some good things with this. And like I said, I believe they've done a great job of making this run in the background and not make it super scary for users. And again, they've insulated you because they can turn it off in mid-encryption and not lose data. It'll just pick back up and start encrypting where it left off. But um, again, if they're out there, you don't have as much control, so it just depends on how you want to manage that as a, an IT organization. In Microsoft, MSIT, we've rolled this out and, and are still rolling out in spots to actually enforce the policy, and they do this all the time. Now, our environment, I will wholeheartedly admit, is a bit unique. We have uh, some fairly technical users. Um, but it is, it is actually a very cool way to actually roll this out. So if you have existing users, you don't have to have them return and bring their PCs to the IT shop. You can actually push that policy out, push the agent out via CM, Configuration Manager, and go ahead and start enabling them to get up and running. In fact, what some of our customers have done is they'll actually roll out the agent as part of their standard process, and then they'll just enable the policy as they need, right? because the agent does nothing without policy, because it's all about enabling and enforcing based on policy, right? OK, next one. What's really cool about this is you don't have to be an administrator to do this. Now, typically, when you think about encrypting a drive, and if you've used BitLocker separately, you do have to be an administrator, right? MBAM's taken that away and now allows a standard user 
to be able to quickly do this. They can encrypt the computer, they can change their pin or password, and we actually give them a new control panel applet that minimizes what they can do. They can't suspend, they can't unencrypt. Things that you want to be able to enforce in policy are now there. Now, the one thing we don't do is we don't remove that other one by default. So you need to limit that via policy, but that's pretty simple to do, to go ahead and add a policy to remove that as needed. For your power users, you may want to have it in there, but it makes it pretty simple. And again, you can see the control panel applet makes it very simple to, to leverage. And I can show you how that works as well. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, walk through a, a quick demo of this. That's your uh, preview in case uh, Tim's demos didn't work. We'll go one more. Okay. All right. So this is uh, a client that I have. It's joined the network. I've taken that policy that we've uh, created, and I'll show you. We'll actually do a, walk through some creating policy here in a minute. But it's read that policy, and I've done a couple of things on here. You'll see there's three options on the bottom. One is obviously start. That's the one I want the, but the users to push, right? And notice that's highlighted by default. But I can give them a couple of other options. And these are available via policy. Sometimes if you're rolling this out and they're already working on their machine and they're running to a meeting, the last thing they want to do is start encrypting their drive. So that postpone option is pretty valuable. And they can postpone and then 90 minutes later, they'll have to be prompted again. Okay? So if they're in a rush to go somewhere, don't have time, they can postpone. The next one is request, request exemption. And this you can decide to expose via policy or not. Um, that button can totally go away. But what's nice about this is you can put a website or an email address, and you can actually give them instructions on how to request an exemption. For example, there's times when you may want to, as per, for whatever reason for different users, and we hit this inside of, of, of Microsoft quite a bit, because people will have demo machines. They're constantly recycling. They're taking up and down multiple partitions. It really is a nightmare sometimes when you think about managing a bunch of people like uh, here at Microsoft. Um, so I'm on that uh, exemption list, and since it's my product, uh, MSIT kindly has given me that right. Uh, and I keep getting emails on this. They've actually done it via email. So the users can push request an exemption. They can then generate the email. It gives them an email address, gives them instructions. And then you can go through and actually create a security group, place the user in the security group, and they can be exempted from a BitLocker. So it gives you some flexibility. And this is what I like about this in an enterprise deployment, is you do need some flexibility. But yet, we haven't made it so complicated that you can't deploy it. Okay. All right, let's walk through and we'll actually start and do a couple things. So we'll hit Start here. OK, first thing comes up is it goes out and looks on the network and looks at the policy for what I'm going to do. If I was just going to have a TPM-only encryption, I would not see this screen. But on the OS volume, I've chosen to have a TPM plus PIN. Now, what that means is every time the machine boots up, it's going to come up and prompt the user for a PIN. What's really great about that is if, you know, as you guys were uh, going around Las Vegas here, if you got out of that limo and left your bag in the car and it drove off and they claimed they couldn't find it, Anybody that turns that machine on, the first thing they're going to see is a pin. If they decide, I don't know the pin, I'm just going to yank the hard drive, guess what? It's, it's totally encrypted. They can't get in. If they try to break into the pin, again, they'll get a TPM lockout. They're not going to get in. So it's actually a very cool solution. I really like TPM plus pin. So in this instance, you can control the complexity. We've made it really simple for our users, so we're just going to put in uh, four things in our pin. Most people are used to the four pins. Uh, you can create as many as you want. What's nice about that is there's a lot of combinations you can create with the minimum four, but you may make it bigger at six or eight. Um, but understand, I, I was talking to uh, a customer, and they were talking about, you know, should I make that pin as long as I want? And you know, you've got to make this usable for users and understand that TPMs, generally, most TPMs will have an uh, attack uh, attack feature in it, that if you try to log in like four or five times and keep hitting the wrong pin, they will lock. And it varies per manufacturer, but some may lock 20 minutes, some may lock an hour. So as you look at your hardware and look to implement this, understand how your TPM behaves. So if your users fat finger it once or twice, typically not going to get it, but it's a, it's a good feature. But I would 
probably urge you not from mandatorily requiring a 20 number pin, uh, but that's just me. You guys can decide. Again, we give you flexible solutions. You can go as, as far or as narrow as you would like. All right, we'll go ahead and create our pin. Now it comes in and it says what? I love this feature because I gotta tell you, um, as my, my team can tell you, I uh, forget to plug power in quite a bit. And if you're encrypting a drive and it's gonna take three, four, five hours to do, you probably don't wanna have a hard power failure, okay? We do a good job of insulating that, it should recover. But the first thing we do is we say, do a quick check. So if I've got something in the DVD drive or I'm missing this, again, we check the system requirements, make it very easy. So I'm gonna go ahead and steal my power from one source and go to the other. Just for my own peace of mind, let me make sure I've got good battery power over here. Again, my team can attest that I've uh, done some fun things trying to make sure it works. Okay, so now I've got that. I'll go ahead and hit continue to the next step. It'll go ahead and recheck that system requirement. If it meets it, there you go. Probably should. I had to sneak a feature in for the, you know, something for the future. Yeah, I, I just noticed that when I was doing this as well. Sometimes uh, we don't speak our English as good as we should. We'll work on that. Uh, so yeah, that was a, an error. Something to look forward to in the next release. Uh, okay, so now it goes off and starts encrypting. Now this is actually very simple. It goes off and runs. The user can minimize this. We give them clear instructions. It's a one-time event. Hopefully you don't see encryption failures. Uh, I, the demo was going too smoothly, but I'll, I'll show you the control applets. Um, here is the new control applet that comes in. If you look at the other control applet, this is all about, you can actually do a lot of administrative functions in here. In the new control applet, and again, I recommend probably limiting what you can do with uh, and take that other one out. But if you go into this other control applet, it takes a second for it to come up. You'll see it's a little more straightforward. We don't give as many options. And it makes it fairly simple for the uh, user to go in and just see the status, but not change the status of what's going on with BitLocker itself. Okay, there's the, okay. So you'll see I don't have options to manage. I'm literally just reporting the status and can go with it from there, okay? I'm not sure uh, why it failed encryption, but uh, we'll just assume it worked great and move forward. I don't have time to troubleshoot it. Okay, so let's uh, walk forward and go on to the next step here. So we talked a little bit about, um, oh, that's the wrong one. Let's go here. Okay, so we talked about the client. We saw how that works. Now let's talk about managing the, the client itself. So what we looked at when we looked at BitLocker, BitLocker has a lot of flexibility and a lot of options. And the feedback we got, as we said, from customers was, I'm not sure what to enable and what will conflict and how these will all work. You've got OS volumes, fixed drives, removable drives. How do I make all this work across? So we worked very hard uh, working with the BitLocker team, working with customers to try to get a set of end-to-end -end solutions that made it a lot easier to go ahead and, and push this out. So one of the things that's important with this is those same BitLocker policies, many of them have been pulled across, but not necessarily all of them. Okay, in order to make that simple environment. And we've also added a number of new MBAM-specific policies. Now, what you don't want to do is implement both BitLocker policies and MBAM policies, because they will try to enforce on top of each other. So when you actually roll out MBAM, only use the MBAM policies. Okay? And the new MBAM policies we offer are listed there. The idea of the auto unlock for fixed data volume. So if somebody has an OS drive, that they have fairly small, maybe 50 gig or 75 gig, and they've got a 500 data volume. You want to encrypt both of those, and then we provide an auto-unlock method. So once they log into the machine with the pin on their OS drive, you can go ahead and auto-unlock that fixed data drive. Uh, you can see the other options there that give you uh, some really nice options to select and choose from client behavior to uh, how the user will interact with the system, okay? Now the policy locations, I'll walk through and show you where this is. They're installed as part of that install. We showed you the group policy template pushes these in and allows you to go through and select these. And they are called out very specifically MDOP, MBAM policies. All right, improving compliance reporting. The scenario of 
you know, the, the call you don't want to get is, you know, I lost my laptop. Okay, well, did it have any personally identifiable information, uh, not just for you, but for customers and other things? If you need to know that kind of information, how are you going to get it? And that's what MBAM can help you do with it. It's knowing the last state of when a computer checked in, was it encrypted or not? The next one is, how effective is the rollout of MBAM across your enterprise? Are you truly protected as an enterprise? Are you 60% compliant or are you 10% compliant? Um, who's, who and when keys have been accessed? So do you have a rogue at the help desk that's getting a bunch of keys and actually going in and getting people's data? You don't want that either, so you need to have some sort of audit mechanism. So the MBAM agent goes ahead and pushes information up to the reporting server, and all this information can be, be carried and, and recorded on the back end. SQL reporting services is how we build this out. We showed you that in the, in the pillars and components up front that goes forward. Here is a list of the four main areas that we actually pull together. Uh, the enterprise, the computer compliance, the recovery audit report, and a hardware audit report. And this gives you the flexibility to see across your enterprise how MBAM is working, how it's being used and utilized. And we'll walk through this as we, we'll go through each of these in the demo here in a second. Now, we talked about it's important for the help desk to be able to help people recover. I roll out this security solution. I've, I've chosen to give people uh, four pins, four easy things to remember, and yet what's going to happen? Somebody's going to forget them. Something's going to happen, right? They're going to change their... Uh, one for their money access card, they're going to get them confused, something's going to happen, they're going to end up calling the help desk. That's the reality of what we live in. So BitLocker provides that central way for you to do that. And we talked about this early on, about the tier one and tier two, depending on which of those local groups you put them in. You can control and require what they can actually access. Now, what this looks like for a user is if they go ahead and, you know, can't get into their machine, they go into what we call recovery mode. And this is what the screen looks like when you're in recovery mode. It comes up and shows you a recovery key that you type in, and that is a very long number, and nobody likes to type that in. So we've actually limited it based on the first eight characters. Now, we do that because on the back end, what we do is when users log into their machines, we build a user device affinity, and we do a cross lookup. So when somebody calls the help desk, they say, what's your uh, user ID? Well, it's Tim. And what's your uh, first eight, eight digits? And I can type those in. And we look and make sure that we're only exposing information for machines they've logged in. Because you don't want them sitting in the uh, uh, CEO's office, go into recovery mode, and try to break in. Right? You want to make sure you're indeed talking to the right person. Now, once you get those eight digits in that recovery key, the help desk is going to come back and give them a 48-digit key that they're going to type in. OK? And I'll show you a method you can do that. You can email it. You can read it over the phone. You can uh, text it to them however you want. But that's, that's the methods that you're going to do. Now, what's really cool about this is the first thing a user is going to do when they get that recovery key is what? Probably write it down and put it next to all their other passwords under their keyboard or sticky note it on their screen, right? Doesn't that make us all feel secure? <laughs> so what we've done in MBAM is we've given you the ability to do this with what we call single-use recovery keys. So the user now can actually use that. Once the agent is recovered, the agent comes back online, recognizes it's come out of a recovered state, and then it will actually then talk to the web service. The web service will realize that that key's been used. It'll issue a command to actually regenerate a new recovery key. That's actually a very, very cool feature and gives you a much more secure, uh, you know, sleep better at night kind of feeling, right? So once that recovery key's been used, that user can write it down all they want. They can send it to everybody on the enterprise. But once they get back on the network and that agent's able to talk to that web service, it'll uh, clean itself up. And you'll not get to use that recovery key again. Now, one thing that uh, you want to understand and remember as we, we do this is if you go into recovery mode, you may want to ask why you're in recovery mode, OK? Because one of the nice things that BitLocker provides is it provides that um, integrity of the boot system. So if you have something that is trying to change that boot order, that boot system, that boot process, we're going to throw our arms up and say, what, somebody's been tampering here. I'm in recovery mode. Now, a lot of times, you'll probably have the user admit, yeah, I was trying to do something. I did this. At least that's what we see a lot at Microsoft, because we all like to tinker, right? But in your enterprises, 
you know, one of your help desk processes may want to be, oh, you're in recovery mode, let's talk, and you may have to dispatch a help desk person to see if indeed they didn't get a virus or something that's trying to root itself, a keyboard logger or something, stuff like that you want to be very careful of. So actually there's a nice added level of security that you get by using BitLocker above and beyond just encrypting the volume, but actually getting, you know, first warning, if you will. It's kind of like when the dog barks during an earthquake, or before an earthquake, rather. Uh, hopefully it's telling you when something bad is uh, going to happen, okay? All right. The next feature is a hardware capability management. And this is kind of interesting. When uh, early TPM rolled out, uh, there was a question of what was capable in each of the hardware versions, okay? So what we did is we, we talked to customers and there was some questions on how to manage this. Um, this is not a problem if you have hardware that's uh, probably in the past three to four years, probably not an issue. If you have older hardware that you want to implement this on, that you bought during uh, early days of Vista, for example, you may want to test it. And if you're going to test it, you have two choices. One, you can do all the testing, you know what your hardware is, and just roll with it. That's actually the default in AMBAM, is this feature is disabled that we assume if it's TPM 1.2, it's good. If you have, you know, some spurious hardware on your network and you really want to be secure and make sure it's only being deployed the ones you want, this is a great tool because you can actually turn on the hardware capability management. We'll actually detect the version of the, the BIOS, the TPM, report that back to the server, and then you as an administrator, administrator say which ones you want to enable and say it's compatible, I've tested it, and once you flip that switch, the agent checks in and says, oh, I'm compatible, and then it can actually start running through that process of enabling and enforcing policy. Before that, it just reports home and says, hey, I, here's what I am. I'm a Lenovo XYZ with this BIOS and this TPM. You know, tell me what you want me to do. And I'll, and I'll show you this in the demo. So it's, it's a nice feature to have, but I will uh, suggest that, you know, it's not something that, again, by default, we've turned it off because we don't think many customers require this, but it's something that we'll show you and, and you can decide in your enterprise. All right, so let's walk through and uh, look at this. Give me just one second to clean this up. Okay, let's go here. All right, here is our uh, server. And on this server, I've, I've put some shortcuts over here to kind of walk through and see how this works. Now, a couple things to note. If you um, go into Active Directory, if you're implementing uh, MBA, or BitLocker today, if you go look at clients, you can actually see BitLocker recovery keys will actually store an e directory or an active directory. You can actually do this um, by policy with BitLocker and say, I want to always write this to Active Directory. And you can still do that in addition to writing it out to the MBAM store. I don't know that you need to, um, but just be aware that that's one of the things that we're trying to do is take that key out of directory and put it in a more secure location that you can control outside of the directory. So you don't have to worry about all the directory rights. Because in here, anybody that has rights to that, uh, the computers in there could actually see that key. All right, so you, you want to be aware of that. Now, let's take a look at a couple other things. We talked about the local users and groups. This is actually the users and groups on that machine. And when they're installed, you'll see now when I ran that agent install, I now have several MBAM groups, okay? And these are the ones we showed you in that, the MBAM advanced help desk users, compliance, and so forth. The uh, system administrator, Again, by default, is the person that installed. So it's the Contoso administrator. But I've also come in and done some things to show us, uh, walk through a couple features here, and show you how this works on the uh, recovery portal, that under the advanced help desk users, I just have the IT admin or administrator. And then over here on help desk users, I have IT help desk. And this is a security group that I've created. It's actually a user for the purpose of the demo. It's not a security group. But I'll log in, I'll show you the difference that you'll see. But these are the groups, and again, it's very easy to add in. You guys, I'm not gonna walk through a, a seminar on how to do groups, that gives you an idea. All right, so now um, let's talk about how policy is actually set up. 
So I'll go into the group policy management editor. Um, let's go to the root here. And I'll go to the default domain policy. I don't want to do it that way. There we go. And we'll go in and edit that. All right, so I'm going to go into computer configuration. I'm going to go under policies. I'm going to go under administrative templates. And I'm going to go under Windows components. And as you look in here, you'll see that I do have BitLocker and I do have MBAM. Okay? We're not removing anything. So if you're using BitLocker policies today, you do not want to use them once you implement MBAM. Okay? In fact, if I were to open these, kind of look at the numbers here, and then if we flip down here to MBAM, you'll see that, again, probably 80 to 90 percent of the policies are here. We just tried to narrow down the, the options. Again, so we have that end-to-end -end support method. So I don't think you're going to really miss much functionality unless you're doing something very, very specific to, to BitLocker. And if you are, that's the, the beauty of policy in GPO is you can still control and maintain those specific pockets you need. But in here, uh, let's go ahead and open this up a little bigger so you can see. I'm going to go into client management. I'm going to go ahead and hit this first one, uh, configure MBAM services. Now in here, in configuring the MBAM services, this is where you're telling the agent of where it's going to communicate to that web service. Okay? So just when we installed our services, you saw as part of the default install, we put those in so you can make a note. It's that same server, and then it just has the name of the service. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Now remember we said it also talked about the frequency of how often the client checks in. Now here you can see we're checking in every 90 minutes to make sure we've got a recovery key and a key package up in the store. Okay? And again, what happens if I can't communicate with it that time, something goes wrong? Do we store that? No, we just try again in the next 90 minutes. Okay? But we will never encrypt a drive with MBAM unless we're able to store that key in the store and then we'll encrypt. So we'll never encrypt a drive if you're using MBAM unless we have that key stored securely. Okay? And then the compliance and status reporting by default is quite big. Here we're saying 720 minutes. Um, you can crank that down if you want to be uh, more frequent. But again, if you're looking for scale, ask yourself how frequently and how uncomfortable I would be, meaning do I need that every 720 or do I need it every 360, every 60? I think 720 is probably a pretty good number. And that's where we got to when we worked with our uh, early deployment customers and got feedback. All right, so that's the first one. The next one is hardware compatibility. By default, this is not configured. Um, I'll walk through and show you the demo. I actually have some data in here that actually has that configured, but uh, I, I have it currently uh, disabled at this point. And then finally, uh, this is, again, if I want to allow the option to provide an exemption, again, you can do a URL, an email address, or a phone number. And this is just a message that they get, and they act on it, and then you manage that back-end security group and how to do it. And here, again, Krabby Tim, or Krabby Admin, at Contoso.com is what I have them doing. All right, so that's my first set of policies that I've done. Now I could put additional policies up here as far as the fixed data and, and other drives. But just to show the flexibility, I've actually come down here and uh, I'm going to do that in another container. And again, this is just standard uh, group policy options. So anybody can, you can roll this out all in one container at the, the root or I can do it at multiple. So I'm going to come here. And now that I've created those policies, I may say these people in the marketing department, they're a real security risk. I guess I should actually select the right policies. I was clicking and not thinking there. Okay, so I'm going to Windows Components. Again, there's my BitLocker policies. I'm going to come down here to my MBAM. And here I'm going to go into my operating system drive. Okay, and this is the first most important one on here. And in here, you can see what my policy is. I've enabled this to be TPM and PIN. Now I can say TPM only. We do require a TPM. That's how we are actually storing the, the key initially so they can uh, pull it out. But you can say TPM and PIN. And I, I highly, highly, highly recommend TPM and PIN for laptop users. It really makes a lot of sense. Physical machines, if they're on the desktop, TPM may be sufficient if you're uh, worried about people pulling a drive or doing something like that. Um, that's up to you. And then again, the length is configurable. 
uh, I've selected four. You can make that as big or as little as you'd like. A couple other ones that I, I won't spend um, a lot of time on, but you have removable drive capabilities. You think about how much uh, data can leave a company on removable drives. What's really cool about this is you can actually say, you know what, with BitLocker, I'm going to enable that they have to have uh, protection on removable drives. So if they're going to copy anything on a removable drive when they put that in, BitLocker and MBAM enforce that now, that you can't write anything unless you encrypt that BitLocker drive. That's pretty cool. That provides a huge functionality and capability to make sure data doesn't go anywhere you don't want it. Okay? So, you know, poke around. There's great features and functions in here from uh, BitLocker that MBAM just leverages and provides an enterprise method to do it. But once you get your policy set, again, these are group policy objects. They flow down when users log in and the machines log in. They can be applied and uh, easily get uh, enforced across the enterprise. The next part I want to show is actually how this looks with the administration monitoring uh, site itself. So this is uh, my server address. You'll see it's at the root, right? So I've got it at the root of the server. And here I'm going in, I get just a nice little brief system overview of how this works. So let's go check our compliance across the enterprise first. So we'll start with enterprise compliance report. We'll click on this. And it's going to go out and look across my enterprise. And you can see here I've got some uh, funky colors up here. Uh, probably not looking too good if we're trying to only see green. But I see that I've got you know, a large portion that are compliant to my enterprise. I've got some that are non-compliant and some that I have exempted because of hardware reasons, right? And you can actually filter this and do some really nice things if you want and say, I only want to see non-compliant machines. Show me that. If I, want to, if I have a lot of uh, movement in my machines, meaning people are recreating machines, I can, instead of making it unlimited, I can say, only show me stuff in the last two weeks, right? So you can make sure that you're seeing only the most correct, latest, up-to-date data if that's important to you. Okay, so that's a quick look at that. The other thing that's nice is you can go down and drill down on individual machines. So if I want to see what's on this, why it's exempt, I can go and see more details, see what my risks are, see what it is. It's portable, it's non-compliant, and then I can actually follow up there. I can see the users that are actually using that machine. I could send them a, an email if I needed to follow up, however you wanted to do that. Now, the next step is computer compliance. So let's take a look at this. So this is the case of the users here at uh, MMS get out of the limo, and uh, they've left their laptop in there. They call the help desk. How do I know if they were uh, compliant or not? What's nice is most users don't really know their machine name. <laughs> yeah. I love it when you ask a user a question like that. What is your machine name? Fred? And <laughs> they don't know, which is OK, because that's what we want to abstract, right? So we make it very simple for them to be able to come in and say, well, here's my username. And again, because we build that user device affinity on the back end, we can easily go out now and see, oh, uh, Acon, the user ID, is up with these three computers. And then at that point, I can ask some more questions and say, you know, was it your laptop? How big was the disk? Because I can actually pull this out and look at the different pieces of information and see um, what kind of stuff was on the drive, what OS, was it encrypted, was it compliant, any errors. Makes it very easy to start going through and finding that. If I come in here and type a specific machine, I'll show you this one specifically. This is great news because this one that we lost, if we had lost a machine, um, looks like it's reported back as compliant. So I can come in here and see that all of the information. Drive C was encrypted with a TPM and PIN. It met our policy. It comes back green. Green is good. And uh, we're all very happy. OK? So that's an important thing if you think about how you're tracking assets across your enterprise. It gives you a nice way to be able to do that. All right. Now let's go in and do a uh, quick recovery. So here is the standard view that I see as an administrator. OK? I'm logged in as an administrator. I'm basically the tier level, tier two of the help desk. So I can see everything I need. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch users for a second. Yeah. Okay, so the question was they've been using it for several months now, and it says it's compliant, but when you drill down, it's non compliant?
Yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to see. There's some interesting things that happen on a couple of things. For example, if I'm hardware exempt, um, I will show up as compliant because I've exempted the hardware. So it looks like it's non-compliant, but when you drill into it, it'll say it's compliant. And so talk to me after, and we'll take that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, some of the ways it comes down, it should be reporting the truth, but it just may be not looking quite the way that's driving. So talk to me after, and we'll actually take a look at that. OK, let me log in as this user here. So now I'm logging in as IT Help Desk. Uh, just a standard user. Um, they have very limited rights. OK, so remember we talked about the local groups and how you use the local groups to manage it appropriately. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to go ahead and launch uh, the portal. And now take a look at this, what his world is or her world. Much different than that last one, isn't it? They can only do some very specific tasks. And that's because I don't want them ruling the world. I don't want them doing more than they should. So now I'll come in here and I'll hit Drive Recovery. Now, again, this is uh, your extra credit and probably a, an eye chart to see from there. But if you notice, there's little red dots on there, uh, on user domain, user ID, key ID. These are required fields. On my last one, I only required the key ID. Because I was administrator, I was trusted, I was that tier two support person. But if I'm a tier one support person, I'm going to require them to put in all of the information. So I'll put in Contoso, I'll put in the uh, user, and then I'll put in the recovery key. The user is uh, talking to us on the phone. They're reading the first eight digits, right? We showed you that. And we'll go ahead, and then you also, and I like this a lot, because you can actually put in the reason this happened. And this is important when you're talking about the incident tracking at the help desk. What is causing the, the problems? Um, we'll go ahead and say that they lost their PIN and submit it. Now what comes back is I get a nice little dialog here. It takes a second because of the VMs and all that stuff. But what comes back is that full 48-digit recovery key they can leverage. Boy, that is a secure solution, isn't it? Let me actually see here. User is not valid for this drive. Boy, I'm so close. Contononoso? Now, isn't that sad? You've all seen Contoso so many times. <laughs> there we go. See, now that is a secure solution. You've got to type in things correctly. Just as my heart fell, I was saved by someone in the audience. Thank you. OK, so here's the recovery key. Now, again, I said reading that over the phone may not be feasible. If you have to, that's great. But you can also copy it and actually then email it to the user. You know, in the world of mobile phones, it's sure nice to say, Look, check your mobile phone. You've got your enterprise email. You can get it. Um, you can actually save a package, which will, you can take it on a USB if you have to deploy somebody. If this is one of the VIPs in the organization, you can do that. They can walk in with that recovery package on a USB, boot it up, and get in. Um, or again, you can read it over the phone, as I said, and, and get in that way. So that gives you a bit of an idea. Now, if we uh, go ahead and log back out of this, we uh, go up here. We'll go back to our uh, other guy. Where well, that's just off. Uh, we'll log this user off and go back in. And we'll see that that whole experience again on this other side. The administrator. Okay. And again, in here, I only require the uh, eight digits of the recovery key. This is a trusted user. Again, this would be the tier two. And this digits of the recovery key should only be seen basically when they go into recovery mode. So typically, this means somebody's physically gone to that workstation and gotten that information. OK, so there you go. There's the recovery key in this scenario. And again, I like that layered approach to actually providing that capability for you. OK, the last piece I want to show is, uh, well, I'll quickly touch base on this. Manage the TPM. It's very similar to recovering the password. Um, you'll have things like a TPM lockout, where they've pounded on it, and it's locked the TPM. Um, you can actually get a TPM recovery key. The only gotcha on this is we have to own the TPM in order to get this key in the first place. Um, so you don't see TPM lockouts often, but if you do, we have a solution to actually manage that. OK, here's the hardware feature. Hardware comes in and reports itself. If you have this policy turned on, we will report the hardware. The hardware can come in. And then again, you can select this. 
and say, once you've tested that, I can see the satellite A205, the BIOS, the TPM version. I can go in and I can say if I want them compatible or not. I'm going to not flag that one since it doesn't have a TPM. Neither of these do. So I can't really flag either of them as a, a TPM valid. I don't know why we have such high TPM versions there. Um, that's what you get in the demo. But suffice to say, it makes it easy to easily come in and say that's either compatible or if I had a problem with it, I could change it to incompatible and go ahead and get the system going. Um, the last report that I want to show you was the hardware audit report or the recovery audit report. We talked about this, that I need to be able to track what happens in the enterprise. So when I've gone in and, and done this in this last one, I'll just show you this real quick. You'll see that just a couple of minutes ago, again, apparently this is on mountain or a different time zone, I was able to come in. The administrator requested this. They had the recovery key. You can see the um, IT help desk also did it and had a lost pin. Right? So all of that is tracked and auditable inside the uh, database as well. All right. There's your uh, management portal. Let's flip back and uh, finish up. All right. So a couple things to note. When you're testing this and rolling this out for the first time, these are a couple of helpful things that will get you. Um, one of the things we do, because we're an enterprise solution, when the client starts up, it randomizes its start time. So in that 90-minute interval, the first time you install the MBAM agent, it'll come up and it'll wait. It takes some differential between when it was started and 90 and kind of randomizes it. So if you're rolling this out, you don't slam your network. So you'll want to put in this, this key, uh, no startup delay. So if you're testing it, you're not just sitting there waiting for it to pop up. Okay? The other thing that can happen is if you are enabling hardware, um, one of the other gotchas is you'll actually detect the hardware, it'll put it back on the server, it'll say uh, unknown, you'll change it to compatible or incompatible, and then at that point, you'll wait. And that's why you want to take this off, because by default, the uh, agent waits, I believe it's at least a day, it may even be two days before it comes back and checks. So just be aware of that. If you're demoing this and testing it, you'll want to make sure that those options are set up in your agents. Okay. Extensibility. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, and I've included a number of slides as resources for you if you want to look at more on this. But the idea of custom reports is we've tried to use very standard things. It's SQL Server Reporting Services. You can leverage that. You can customize these. You can see the databases, what they contain. Makes it very simple to do. Um, all the reports are built on these. You can see the, the recovery hardware or the recovery hardware database and the compliance database and the options in those. And then finally, We've also done key recovery APIs. Again, these are web services. These are public and available that you can actually go ahead and, and use these. We've had uh, some customers talk about using these to create their own self-service recovery portal. And uh, we do make those available that you can actually use these. And again, I'm not going to walk through uh, all these, but I'll give you that as reference. And uh, they'll be available in the slide deck that you can download and look at those. And then the same with the TPM recovery. So basically, everything that we expose in our, our web service uh, via the portal, we try to make available to you as well. All right, so in summary, with MM, we try to look at some of the top asks from uh, BitLocker customers to make sure it's more manageable, easier to use, simplify provision, give you a compliance and reporting solution, and help you manage the costs. And I hope you saw that it's easy to deploy, uh, requires little, if any, day-to-day -day management, and is really a flexible, customizable solution. So with that, oh, and it is available now. I like to talk uh, about what you can get today. Six months ago, it shipped. So I encourage you to please complete your session evals. It's very important to me to get your feedback. Um, please take the time to do that. I'd really appreciate it. And with that, we'll open it up for uh, general questions. So if you can go to the mics, that will help. If not, I'll try to repeat the question. So thank you very much. Go ahead. Two, if you don't mind. First, I think I saw a field in, in some of the hardware reports that had a connotation of mobile or something to that effect. Is that right? Yeah, what we try to do is we actually try to detect based on what we know about that. They can report whether it's portable or not. Portable, that's and what it was. And you can act on that. So it gives you an idea up front if it's a laptop or not. Because you may want to have different policies and act on it in a different way. That's good for us. All right, so secondly, is there a way to do key rotation for the certificates used to actually encrypt the device, the hard drive? 
So we have, from a PCI compliance perspective, we have a requirement. If somebody can actually get a hold of a key, then we have a requirement to rotate that key every year at least. Um, so you're talking on the servers themselves? Can I rotate the key on the servers? Because we do rotate, we don't, oh, okay, so there's two parts. Oh, okay. So the question was if the key's used to encrypt the drive, can we rotate that key? The uh, answer is today we don't have an easy way to do that. I'll take that feedback. Um, the only way I'm aware of, uh, where's uh, my counterparts? I was going to say if they know any way, but I don't believe there is. Paul, do you know of any way to do that? Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. That's one. I'll take that back. Uh, Paul, if you can make a note for me I'm, if I get some of those. Okay, let's go over here. Yeah, um, a couple questions. First, um, how does uh, MBM, as far as deploying it, work with uh, systems that have already been bit lockered with a pin? Okay, so how does MBAM work where you've already used System Center to deploy BitLocker? Yeah, so like we've already done our Windows 7 deployment. We're looking at MBAM. We're using that BDE vault um, oh, okay. source TechNet code. But, yep, yep. Um, so we're looking to roll out MBAM. Uh, I'm just wondering how that plays with, since all our users are already BitLockered and have pins in place. Yeah, what would happen is we would uh, basically roll out our policy. Uh, we look at the encryption status of the drive. And uh, basically, you would, you would uh, disable the current policy, replace it with the BitLocker policy, and then any new machines would fall under that. It, wouldn't, it shouldn't decrypt the drives in any way because it's the same policy, but we do check the status, and then you'd be able to get the central re reporting and all those benefits. Okay. That answer. Thank you. Okay. Over here. Yeah, I got, I got a lot of questions, actually. Uh, I missed part of the first few minutes. I, I understand it doesn't support Vista Enterprise at all in BAM. That's correct. It only supports Windows 7 uh, Enterprise and Windows 7 Ultimate. Uh, what happens if you're doing an upgrade deployment with Windows 7 and on a Vista machine that already has BitLocker deployed and we're storing our keys up in Active Directory right now? Is, is the process for the task sequence that we implement and incorporate, you know, uh, stand-up MBAM on the side? So will, will those start getting sucked into MBAM on, on Yeah, those? so you're trying to, you're upgrading from Vista to Windows 7. Yeah. So you get on a supported platform, will those get sucked in? The answer is yes, they'll get recreated and stored in our, our system. Should I set up like a, a WMI filter on my current GPO for the Vista clients so that they don't get the MBAM policies? Or um, will the, those ignore the MBAM GPO settings? The only thing that is going to honor the MBAM policies is the MBAM agent. Okay. So you can push the policy all over the world, but it's not going to do anything unless there's an agent there to enforce it. Right. So I've got about 30,000 clients. Do I essentially need four servers, two reporting um, service servers? 3,000 clients. We can support 30,000. How many? 30? 30, yeah. Um, depending on the, the speed of rolling it out, you would probably want to go with a two-server model. Two total? Or yeah. And yeah. What, I would, what I'd recommend in that is in the, in the slide deck, I had a reference to the um, scalability white paper. Take a look at that. Okay. I mean, 30,000 you should easily be able to support, and you don't have to have much hardware. Single can, box can it run can on a virtual 10, box. What's that? Can those servers be virtual? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. MSIT has rolled theirs out with virtual servers. Do we need any AD domain admin privileges to set this up? Do you need any AD domain admin There's privileges? There's no interaction with AD after you set up MBAM, right? Once you get the policies in there, yeah. you don't have to. Okay. Everything else is database. Uh, for the exemption process you guys have built into that interface, when you put in an email address or a URL, is there a prompt for the user to put in their justification, or are they just going to fire off their Outlook client or something? You know, this is, uh, this is why I didn't demonstrate this feature. <laughs> it's uh, literally just notification. So we're not doing a mappy call to pull up their mail message or anything like that or anything fancy. It's literally information to say, if you want to be exempt, you're going to have to email or click on this link or here's a message on who to call. I can link out to a SharePoint. Yes. And then they can fill a form. Okay. Yeah. So in the policy, you could put in a URL, and then they can click on that and give them more details. But you know, we don't uh, do much more than that. And you still have to manually add them into the directory and, and things like that. And I, I don't think it's a bad thing, because you really don't want a lot of users exempting out. Yeah. But we haven't automated that much at this point. OK. Now, for the removable devices, um, is there some kind of window of opportunity before if a client doesn't receive the policy settings? In other words, I know with AD and GPOs, there could be a, 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 delay. a, a delay, slow link connection, that type of thing. With the agent being on the client, is there any potential for a machine not getting this policy, and therefore there's an opportunity to put data 
and not have it encrypted on a removable drive, and then the removable drive leaves the... Yeah, we, we don't do anything to audit or manage that time, so... But there is some window, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We're, we're bound by whatever network and policy restrictions you have. So okay. if, you're got a, if you're not updating your policy on a regular basis, uh, or you know it's going to be slow because of other issues, yeah, we will not do anything to say lock everything down. We don't have that level of enforcement. Once the agent's there, we're just watching for policy. Okay. How it gets there and when, we don't care. And one last question. On, on the reporting that shows your machine's out of compliance, is there anything to invoke BitLocker automatically or proactively based on that and just show us a list of uh, machines that were out of compliance but then proactively got turned on automatically? Um, no. That's, that's, one of the, that's, that's a consistent feedback. I mean, right now we do a good job of reporting information um, and we enact on policy that's there. Yeah. But if somebody is continually postponing, for example, there is no postpone five times and then restart. Oh, so the p postponement? Could be indefinite. If the okay. user just keeps hitting it, and that's, that's been a key feedback point from customers that they okay. would like at some point to say, uncle, <laughs> you know, take them over. Thanks. And, and we don't have that in there yet. Okay, I'm flashing here. Do I have more time or do I need to shut down? Thank okay, you. tell you what, we'll shut down, guys, but I'm here. Paul, can you wave your hand? Paul McKnight's one of the other PMs on the team. Grab one of us. We'll shut down for now, but uh, come grab us. We'll talk and answer your questions. Thank you.